Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, how are you? How are you? We well, bless God, sir. Okay. We want to start the lecture. I want to thank all of you. I can see Asian. I can see Om 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 Halanle, Efe, Abdul Aziz. Hello. You are all welcome to today's uh, facilitation. I want to thank God for what we did last week. And then I uh, want to do a new lecture today. So last time we looked at uh, the root, the root system. After the root system, we looked at the stem system. And then we are scheduled to look at the leaf. But if we continue like that, we may not uh, cover. So I want you to read the root, the leaf. You read it on your own. And read the general structure, the anatomy and physiology of the roots, the transverse section of the roots, the transverse section of the stem, and then the transverse section of the leaves. You have to read those ones on your own so that you can progress. Then you also look at the flowers. Flowers are common things that you even you are you came across it in your secondary school. So we have to look at the flowers also. So today we are going to look at pollination. We are going to look at pollination. And pollination takes place within the flower area. So, and that is the transfer of pollen grains from the anther to the stigma of a flower. So at the end of this facilitation, we'll be able to uh, classify or look at the two major types of pollination. We we'll distinguish between those two major types of pollination. And also discuss the wind pollinated flower, the insect pollinated flower, and the water pollinated flower, and look at the characteristics. So let's look at uh, uh, types of pollination. Pollination is divided into two types. You have the self-pollination and the cross-pollination. The self-pollination and the cross-pollination. So when we talk of self-pollination, it means that the anthers are transferred to the stigma of the same plant, or of the same flower within the same plant. The anthers of one plant is transferred to the stigma of the same flower in the same plant. So, and you know that a plant may have many flowers. So, but when we talk of self-pollination, the anthers of a given flower is transferred to the stigma of that same flower in the same plant. So, self-pollination is divided into two. You have what you call the, by uh, this one that I've talked about, what in this case is called bisexual. That means anthers moving to the stigma of the same flower of the same plant. Then you also have what you call gectonogamy. Here, the anthers are transferred to the stigma of another flower of the same plant. That means the anthers is moving from one flower to another flower to meet the stigma. Though different flower in that same plant, that's, that, that is another form of uh, self-pollination. In this case, we call it gectonogamy. Now, cross-pollination. In cross-pollination, the anthers are transferred to the stigma of another flower of another plant, not the same, fl not flower of the same plant or flower of different flower of the same plant, no. But it is transferred, the anthers are transferred to the stigma of another plant of the same or related species. That's why we call it cross-pollination, cross-pollination. Now, after the pollination, you have fertilization. 
So in that your text, you see a, the diagram of a fertilization process in a flowering plant. Of course, when that enters, drop on the stigma, then it will now continue to grow, passing through the style. From the style, it goes down. It goes down through the what? Down into the oval, and then where it enters the oval, there is a micro pile that is a small opening where that uh, fertilization takes place. Of course, there is nucleus and the embryonic, embryonic, uh, embryo, embryo sac. It is down there in that nucleus that fertilization takes place. So when fertilization takes place, then the next thing that we form is the fruit. And that's why when you see a plant that produces flowers, either that insects comes closer to them, or there's another mechanism that will carry the word, the anthers to the stigma. And when the anthers drop on the stigma, then it go, grows down, it sucks the nutrient there and goes down through the style until it reaches the ovum and then fertilizes the word, the nucleus, and then fertilization takes place. So we are going to look at characteristics of uh, self pollinated flowers. And we're also going to look at characteristics of cross pollinated flowers. Let's look at characteristics of self pollinated flowers first. Now, when we talk of self pollination, we mean that the anthers is carried to the stigma of the same flower or different flower of the same plant. So, in that case, something must happen. The anther and the stigma must match out at the same time. Otherwise, fertilization will not take place. So this process of maturing at the same time, anthers and stigma maturing at the same time, is what we call homogamy. So one of the characteristics of a, a self pollinated flower is what? Homogamy. Maturing. Mm -hmm. Yes, homogamy. That means the stigma and the anthers maturing at the same time because it is moving from the anthers of the same flower to the stigma of the same flower or anthers of one flower to the stigma of another flower of the same plant. So for this to take place, both of them must mature at the same time. And so homogamy is one of the characteristics of self pollinated flower. Homogamy means synchronization of the maturity of the word anthers and the word stigma. Both of them must mature at the same time. If not, that will be a problem. Now, another characteristic of self pollinated flower is what to call clistogamy. 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 Here, there are some flowers that do not open. They get closed and they will never open. But they must what? Fertilize and bear fruit. So, in that case, in that type of plant that doesn't open, fertilization takes place right inside. So, this process is called clistogamy. So one of the characteristics I said is homogamy. The second characteristic is what is uh, clistogamy. Clistogamy is when the flower does you, which means everything will happen between inside. That one is when our they must they must mature at the same time. These are the characteristics of what self pollinated flower. Let's look at characteristics of uh, cross pollinated flower. One of the characteristics of the uh, uh, self pollinated flower is that one is what to call entomophily. Entomophily, ento means insect. You see, in, in cross pollinated flower, insects are always involved in the cross pollination. And for the insect to be uh, involved in the cross pollination, then that uh, flower must what be brightly colored to attract the insect. It must have ne nectar, which also makes the insect to suck there. And it must be what? Brightly colored. So entomophily is a kind of uh, attracting insect. It is one of the characteristics of cross-pollinated because it is the insect that carries the word, the anthers, and move it to the word stigma of another flower of a different word, plant of the same or different species. So entomophily is one of the characteristics of uh, cross 
pollinated the flowers. The another characteristic is what? Anemophily. The other one is what? Entomophily. Ento means what? Insect. Anemophily means wind. Anemo means wind. Anemophily. That means it must be wind pollinated. And if it's to be wind pollinated, it must be light. And then the anthers has to be what? Produce large number of what? Pollen grains. These are the characteristics of wind pollinated. That means anemophily. It must be anemophily. That means it must be it, it must be structured in such a way that wind can carry them away. And we, when wind carries them, wind is carrying them from one plant to another plant of the same or different species. So these are wind pollinated uh, flowers. These are characteristics of uh, cross pollinated. Then the last characteristic is what we call hydrophily. Hydro. The word hydro means water, which means water is involved, especially in aquatic plants. Those plants that stay in the water, they must have the characteristics that enable the water to move the anthers from one plant to another plant, either of the same species or different species. And these characteristics, aquatic characteristics, is what we call hydrophilic. So we have mentioned three things in the cross pollination or cross pollinated flower. One, it must be entomophilic to enable insects to do what? To come and uh, carry, uh, uh, do the, the cross pollination. And allowing insects to come, that means that plant must be what? Brightly colored. It must be what? Contain a uh, nectar, which the implant, the plant uh, suck. And also, it must also, uh, we say it must possess nectar and must be brightly colored. That is called entomophily. Then the other one is uh, anemophily. That means wind pollinated. If it is to be wind pollinated, then it must be light and must produce large number of what? Pulling grains. And then the other one is that, uh, and again, for wind pollinated, they must also what, possess wing-like structures. They must possess wing-like, so that when they are carried by the wind, they can float in the air and be carried to another plant where they will pollinate. Then hydrophilic, I said, for those of them that are aquatic. You know, some of the plants grow in the water. And so those plants that grow in the water are aquatic plants. And so for them, water carries them. And so they must be hydrophilic. And if the water must carry them, they must what? Possess a kind of structure that enables them to float in the, on, the, on the water. So now, having seen that, let's look now go to do uh, an, an, another sub uh, lecture, another sub area called fruit. Now, after fertilization, what comes after fertilization is fruit or fruit and seeds. So, if there is no fertilization, possibly fruit will not form. And that's why we must cherish the role played by insects. We must cherish the role played by pollinators. And that's why we need them in the environment. And that's why we frown against anything that will damage the environment. That's why we frown against the use of insecticides. Most of these insects that they wipe away these uh, pollinators. And when they wipe away pollinators, fertilization will not take place. And when fertilization did not take place, well, pollination will not take place. And if pollination did not take place, fertilization will not take place. And if pollination, uh, fertilization did not take place, we will not have fruit and we will not have seeds. And that's why we must remember that these insects in the environment are very, very important because they help us to get food. So let's look at fruit and seeds. So fruits are matured and ripe over. Fruits are mature and ripe over. And a typical fruit has three distinct parts. The epicarp, the mesocarp, and the endocarp. These are the three things that make up a fruit. The epicarp, the mesocarp, and what? The endocarp. So, at the end of discussion of facilitation on fruits and seeds, we'll be able to uh, define fruits, which I've been able to do. Then we classify fruits. 
and then we differentiate between two different classes, dicotyledonous and the monocotyledonous uh, fruit. And we also look at dispersor, seed dispersor. And then also one of the seed dispersor also include explosive mechanisms. These are the things we are going to look when we finish this, this lecture. So as I said, the fruits are mature and ripe ovary. And these ovary are formed after fertilization. When the anthers drop on the stigma, then it, it grows down, it serves the nectar or the material there and grows down and then pass through the style. And then moving down, it goes to the ovary. And there's a little opening called micropyle. It is from the micropyle that it enters the ovary. And then that is where the nucleus are, are present and fertilization takes place. It is after fertilization that fruits are formed. If you have ever taken a fruit, if you have ever taken a mango, if you have ever taken a, a, an orange, these are how it happens. Happen. It's not by magic. Those fruits you have around you, fertilization, pollination must take place, fertilization must take place, and then you now yes, have sir. the fruit. Yes, so sir. a fruit is what? A, a mature and ripe word, over it. And then the fruit has three layers. It has the epicarp, it has the mesocarp, and it has the what? The endocarp. That's the what makes up the fruit. And then the seeds are found inside. So there are two types of fruit. Fruits are divided into two. They have what to call true fruits and false fruits. Some fruits are true fruits. Some are called false fruits. What are true fruits? True fruits are the only ones that develop from what? From what? Over. They form from one over. These are the called, called true fruits. Then you also have false fruits. False fruits are those fruits that develop from the ovary with the receptacle or even with the calyx. You know, a flower has a calyx that covers the fruit, that covers the flower. It also has the receptacle and then before the flower. So if a fruit should develop and then incorporate the calyx, incorporate the receptacle, and incorporate the ovary, three of them, to form a fruit, and that fruit is a false fruit. So two divisions of fruit. True fruit and false fruit. A true fruit develops from a single ovary. Even though some fruits can develop from multiple ovaries, but a true and simple fruit okay, is a fruit that develops from an ovary in conjunction with the calyx and the receptacles. So when a fruit is formed and encloses this calyx, receptacle, and the, and the ovary, that fruit is not called a true fruit. It is called what? A false fruit. Now let's look at classification of fruits. We have divided fruits into two, true fruits and false fruits. Now let's now go and classify the fruits, simple fruits. So when we talk about simple fruits, a simple fruit is a fruit that develops from only one ovary of a flower. That means one ovary to one flower. If one ovary and forms to one flower, if one ovary and one flower forms a fruit, then that fruit is a simple fruit. But if the ovary, if the fruit is formed from multiple ovary, then that fruit is not a, a simple fruit. It may be called multiple fruits of what we are going to know later. But it may not involve the calyx and the receptacle. Once it involves the calyx and receptacle, no longer a true fruit. It is now a false fruit. So when we now come to true fruit, a true fruit can be divided into one simple fruit. And a simple fruit is a fruit that forms from a same single ovary. Now, simple fruit can be divided into two. That simple fruit that is formed from one of one flower and one ovary. It can be what? It can have dry dehiscence. 
and dry in the heat center. That means when it dry, it can split open. When it dry, it may not split open. That is what we call dry the heat center. The heat center means split open. And in the heat center means it cannot split open. So a simple fruit can split open when it dry. A simple fruit may not split open when it dries. So when it dries and split open, we we'll call it simple dry dehiscent fruit. When it does not split open when it dries, it is called dry in the dehiscent fruit. So dehiscent means split open. In the dehiscent means cannot split open. Now let's look at dry dehiscent fruit. Simple dry dehiscent fruit. The first one we have is legume or pod. Legume or pod. Here, the fruit split into two. Once it is dry, it can split into two. Can you give me an example of a fruit when it dries, it split into two? It can split into two on both sides. So this is what we call legume or pod. Example is what? Granuts. Example is what? Granuts. Another Beans. example is what? Beans. Bambara granuts. You can split open on both sides. So this is what we call legume or pot. Then you have follicle. As an example of uh, dry dehiscent fruits. Follicle. Follicle. This one can split open along one side, not both sides, just so one side to release the seeds. It can split open along one side to release the what? The seeds. But a pod can split open, both sides can split open. If you bring the nut now and you press it, it can split open. Any pod, any legume split open on both sides. And that's why they are called legume or pod. The follicle splits along one side to release the, the, the seeds. Example is sodium apple. It can split along only one side. But a legume split along both sides. But a follicle split along one side when it is dry. The another one is capsule. Capsule. It can split along many longitudinal lines. When it dries, it can split here, 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 along many longitudinal lines, multiple longitudinal lines. And then seeds can come out from each of them. Give me an example of a follicle, of a fruit. When it, it, it dries, it can split along many lines on the long, longitudinal lines. Have you watched okra? Okra. When it okra. dries, okra. Uh -huh. So okra is a follicle. You split along many longitudinal lines when it dries off. So we have uh, we have said legume. We split both sides to release the seeds. Then we move on what follicle that split along one line to release the fruits. Then we talk of what capsule that split along many lines, many longitudinal lines to release the the seeds. So these are dry dehiscent. Then you have another form of fruit called caryopsis. Caryopsis. Here, the pericarp are fused tightly with the seed coat. The pericarp, you know that a fruit has three parts, the epicarp, the mesocarp, and what? The endocarp. Now, this epicarp, mesocarp, and endocarp, three of them are called pericarp. The epicarp, the mesocarp, and endocarp, three of them are called what? Pericarp. Then, a caryopsis is when this pericarp, this epicarp, mesocarp, and endocarp have fused together, even with the seed coat. Even with the seed coat, the seed it is fused together with the seed coat. Remember, the seed inside has a covering called seed coat. So, when this pericarp gets fused together with this seed coat, then that plant is called a caryopsis. Caryopsis. Example is maize. If you bring maize, you find out that maize, in maize, if you bring one, the, 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 the fruit, the maize, 
the, the happy cap, the meso cap, and the words, and the edo cap, they are fused together with the words, the, uh, the, the seed codes. So that is that. Now, you also have akin. Akin. In akin, akin has one seed covered by the pericap, but not tightly fused as in karyopsis. It has epical mesocarp and endocarp, but they are not tightly fused as you have in karyopsis. Example is the sunflower. Example is the sunflower. Then you have the knots. You have the knots. Look at it here. In the knot, the pericarp or seed coat is hard. The pericarp or seed coat is what? Hard. Example is cashew. The pericarp, that means the epicarp, the mesocarp, and the endocarp, they are what? Hard. Example is cashew. So cashew knot, cashew is a knot. Cashew is what? A knot. But if you watch, people say coconut. Coconut is not a knot. Because the pericarp, the, the pericarp, you remember the pericarp is the, 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 the combination of the epicarp, mesocarp, and endocarp. Yeah, they, 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 in knots, they are hard. Like they, 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 know, they are hard. But in, in coconuts, it is not like that. If the epicap in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the coconut is a little bit thin, then the muscle cap is fibrous. Fibrous, you remember. And the endocap is, also, is hard, but the muscle cap is not hard. So that's why coconut is not a knot. Even granite is not a knot. So that is it. Now, another classification of fruit is what to call Samara. Samara. In Samara, the epic, the uh, epic, the pericarp, the pericarp is modified to form a wing-like structure that can allow wind to carry it away. The printer. The printer. The pericarp is modified to form a wing-like structure that allows the wing to cut them away. Then also we have what we call sieve cellar. It's another classification of food. Sieve cellar. In sieve cellar, the calyx above the ovary remain like a parachute. The calyx are modified to form like the, the, the calyx above the ovary is modified to form a parachute that can enable, enable the plant to what to fly. The to the cry carried by the wind. Uh -huh. Example is in Tredas. Tredas procumbus. The calyx above the, the dove is modified to form a parachute that can be carried by the wind. I'm a TV lecture. This is lecture university. These lecture. are the, the different classification of uh, uh, simple fruits. Dry simple fruits. Now let us look at simple fruits that are fleshy. Simple fruits that are fleshy are not dry. The first one is called droop. Droop. D R E U E. D R U P E. Droop. Here, the epicarp are ed uh, uh, the epicarp is thin. The mesocarp are edible, and the endocarp is hard. Example here is mango. If you have ever, you ever taken mango, you find out that the epicarp is thin, the mesocarp is what? Edible, and the endocarp is what? Hard. The different types of mango, even native mango is like that. You can, you can, you can may even take the epicarp and the mesocarp at the same time and see it and swallow it. No problem. But the problem is the endocarp. You cannot eat the endocarp. <laughs> the endocarp that covers the seed is very hard. So, so that fruit is called what? A droop. Now, a there's something we call berry. Yes. Berry. 
very look like a droop, except that the endocarp is what? Fleshy. Except like the endocarp is what? Fleshy. Have you taken an, an orange? <laughs> Have you taken an orange? Uh -huh. You now see it. That the endocarp is what? Fleshy. And then, of course, the seeds are sandwiched inside. Now, aggregate fruits. Aggregate fruits. Single ovary gives rise to more than one fruit. Here, many ovaries, multiple ovaries can give rise. A single ovaries give rise to more than one fruit. That means one ovary can subdivide to give rise to more fruits. This is called aggregate fruit. Example is cola. Cola. If you bring a cola, the native cola we take, if you dissect the fruit, you find out that there is apartment, multiple what? Multiple fruits inside the fruit. Inside the ovary. Inside the ovary can get multiple fruit. A single ovary has given rise to example is cola. When you bring out one cola from inside, it has the epicap, it has the mesocap, it has the endocap. So a single ovary giving rise to multiple fruits. Then another one is called multiple fruits. Here, the fruits develop from the inflorescence and not a single ovary. Example is the pineapple. The fruits develop from multiple inflorescence and not a single ovary, like the pineapple. Plenty of fruits. They from the inflorescence, the flower, they develop to form a fruit. Now, monocotyledonous plants and dicotyledonous plants, we encountered it one time. We found out that a monocot plant is a plant that has one cotyledon. Why a dicotyledon plant have two cotyledons? So these are the, uh, uh, this, this, this is what we discussed earlier. It is also found in fruits. Now, let's look at dispersal. What are the uh, ways of dispersal of these uh, fruits? How can this fruit be dispersed? One, this, the, 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 the seeds can be dispersed through, one, through, uh, animals. You can take seeds and take them out and carry it to another place and eat. after taking the fruits, you, just, you, you throw away the seeds. That's how the seeds will come to that place and germinate. So, through animals, the seeds can be what? Dispersed. Even other animals, oh, poor animals, even birds can come and pick a fruit, take it to a very far place. In the course of the eating, the, 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 the seed may not be digested in the first time. And then when it passes the feces, the seed drops there. Or even in the course of uh, trying to take the, the fruit, the seeds can be dropped there. And so they can germinate. That is agent of seed dispersal. So the bird is an agent, animals are agent of seed dispersal. Can you name other agents of seed dispersal? I want you to name other agents of seed dispersal. Cutters. Eh? Cutters. Uh, cutters cow, are cow. animals. Cutters, cow are animals. Mm -hmm. They can disperse uh, seeds when they take the, this, this, uh, something and go a very far away and drop it. So they are all animals. Birds are animals too. Now, wind is an agent of uh, uh, seed dispersal. Wind, a high wind can blow, uh, especially those ones that will parachute. Especially those ones that parachute, like Sipsela or Samara. You can see them in the air. It can be carried to a very far place and get deposited. And from there, they can start generating now another ecosystem there. So wind is a powerful agent of what dispersal. What of water? Erosion. No, erosion. Does it disperse? 
Yes, sir. Do you understand? Flood. Does yeah. it disperse? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. You can carry the plant to a very far place and drop it. From there, the plant will start growing and, they start, and start germinating. So water is a powerful agent of seed disperser. Another one is what explosive mechanism. Explosive mechanism. As we find in a pentaclatra macrophylla. So the, 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 the fruit can just, once it dry, can hear an explosive of power. And then once it explodes, it takes the seeds to very far places. And from there, they can uh, uh, find themselves and start germinating. So explosive mechanism is another agent of seed dispersal. Now, today we have been able to look at, uh, today we gave you, uh, not assignment, but read on your own. I asked you to read the, 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 the leaf, the, to read the leaf on your own. After you must have done the root, you have done the stem, I ask you to read on the leaf, on the leaf. Look at the structure of the leaf. Look at the leaf venations. Look at modifications of the leaf. And I also ask you to look at uh, the general structure, anatomy and physiology of the roots, of the stem, and on the leaves. You read on your own, no assignment for me. You look at the transverse section of the roots, transverse section of the stem, and the transverse section of the leaves. Look at them very well and monitor and label them, draw them and label them. Draw some to me. You do that on your own. Then today we we'll look at pollination, which is the transfer of pollen grains from the anthers to the stigma. Then we we'll look at types of pollination. We say you have two types: self-pollination. Self is also self-pollination is also called isotogamy, which means Pollinate a plant, a flower pollinating itself. The movement of pollen grains from the anthers to the stigma of the same flower of the same plant. Movement of pollen grains from the anthers to the stigma of the same flower of the same plant. That is bisexual. Now we can also have jectogamy, where we talk, we talk of movement of anthers to the yes. stigma. Yes. Movement of the anthers, movement of the anthers to the stigma of another the flower plant. of the same plant. Yes, but both of them are called self pollination. Then we look at cross pollination, where we noted that uh, this is the movement of pollen grains from the anthers to the stigma of another plant of another flower from another plant of the same or related uh, species. And then from there we look at, we now saw pollination. The pollination is, uh, uh, the, the, we look at diagram of fertilization. We look at diagram of fertilization. We saw when the atlas drop on the stigma, it uh, absorbs nutrients from that area, from that area, and then begin to grow down through the style. It grows down and uh, moves to the oval. And uh, where the oval is called by the uh, cover, uh, it, it, from the oval, it means the nucleus. The, the, the nucleus, there is fertilization. Then there's an opening that enables this, uh, the, the pulling greens to, to the, the, the male garment to move inside. That opening is called the micropyle. So when you go to a textbook, you see it. Then we look at characteristics of self pollinated flowers. Homogamy, both of the anthers and stigma maturing at the same time. Clistogamy, pollination takes place inside flowers that do not open. These two things happen in self pollinated flower. Then in cross pollinated flower, that condition, that characteristic, one is a entomophily, meaning that it develops those structures that attract those insects. And thermophily. It develops structures that attract insects to pollinate to cross-pollinate them. They, that means they are brightly colored and they have nectar. These are structures in cross-pollinated flowers. 
that enable insects to visit them and then do the pollination. So this condition is called entomophily. It's one of the characteristics of cross-pollinated flowers. Another characteristic is anemophily. Most uh, uh, cross-pollinated flowers uh, uh, develop such structures that wind can do the uh, cross-pollination. And for the wind to do the cross-pollination, the flowers must be what? Anemophily. And that means they, they, they are light and produce light number yeah. of uh, holy grains. And they, they, those flowers also possess wing-like structures that enable them to be carried away by the wind. Then another one is homophily. It's one of the characteristics of cross-pollinated flowers. Those fl flowers that stay, plants that stay in the, in the aquatic environment, they produce flowers even in the aquatic environment. So, and then for the flowers to be pollinated, they must develop such structures that water can carry them away. And that is what we call hydrophilic. Then from there, we move to look at the fruits and seeds. Then we said that fruits are mature and ripe world over. And a typical fruit has three layers, the epicarp, the mesocarp, and the endocarp. And the fruit is divided into two, true fruit and false fruit. A true fruit developed from a what? A single ovary. A true fruit developed from single ovary. But false fruit developed from both the ovary, the receptacle, and the calyx. You, you, when we move down, you see that an example of a false fruit is multiple fruits, something like a, a pineapple that doesn't develop from one ovary. Yeah. Now, we now looked at classification of fruits. We say fruits are classified into the following simple fruits that have only one fruit that develops from a single ovary. Then these simple fruits, when they dry, if they can be dry the hissing or dry in the hissing. Dry the hissing means that they can split open when they dry, and dry in the hissing means they cannot split open. Example of dry the hissing fruit is what a legume or pod that splits into two halves. Both, it can split on both sides. Example is what, granite. Then you have a follic that split along only one side to release the seeds. Example is sodom apple. Then you have a capsule. A capsule sp split along many longitudinal lines. Example is okra. Then you have caryopsis. This one is dry in the hissing. They don't split open. An example is caryopsis. What is caryopsis? You see that they, in caryopsis, they have pericarp that are tightly fused with the seed coat. Example here is the maize. Example here is the wheat. Then they have akin. You see, akin has one seed covered by the pericarp, but not tightly flew, uh, fused as in the caryopsis. Example here is sunflower. Then we look at the knots. We say that the knot has a pericarp or seed coat that is what? Hard. Yeah. Pericarp or seed coat that is hard. Example is what? Cashew. If you go to cashew, we find that the, the epicarp, the mesocarp, and the endocarp, they are all hard. In that case, coconut is not a knot because the mesocarp is not hard. The mesocarp is what? A kind of, uh, uh, what do we call it? In coconut, the mesocarp is, uh, is not hard. Do you understand? It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not hard. That's why cashew not. That's why coconut uh, is not. Then you have Samara. I say here in Samara, the pericarp is structured like a wing. Then you have Sipsela. We are the calyx is developed like structure called parachute that can help to the, the, the flower, the plant, the fruit to, to, to be carried by the wind. Mm -hmm. Then we now, we now came to fleshy fruits, simple fleshy fruits. Here you have the droop. A droop is something like a, a mango. There has a thin epicarp, fleshy mesocarp, and hard end. Then you have a berry. A berry is uh, like orange. There has the thin epicarp. There has the soft mesocarp in soft what? Endocarp. Yeah. Fleshy endocarp. Now, 
Then we have aggregate fruit. A simple fruit that gives rise to what? A single yeah. ovary that gives rise to more than one fruit. Example is cola. A single ovary that gives rise to many fruits. If you open a cola, now, you now see that it has many fruits inside. They have multiple fruits like pineapple. This one developed from the what? The inflorescence. The inflorescence, multiple flowers join to produce the what? The, 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 the fruits. Mm -hmm. Then we look at monocot and dicot. And then we look at the dispersal of seeds. One is by animal. Another one is by water. Another one is by wind. Another one is by explosive techniques. These are the processes of uh, seed dispersal. That's why we call it a day to day. Next week, I'm, I, I'm surprised that only 10 people participated in the lecture. And I, I think I sent this note across to you to inform you that the, the lecture is first day by 3 o'clock. I don't know why many of you do not attend the lecture. I think you had this yesterday. So I thank you and God bless you. That's why we call it the 